I probably would not divide the making of something, let's say architecture or buildings, and the writing about buildings as much as some people. Um, certainly you can uh, write in a way and build in a way which in concert with each other. Uh, you can write in a way and not build and implore other people to follow that way. And you can do the opposite. You can build and say, by my buildings, you understand my philosophical stance. Errol Sanin once said, every scheme I make is different because the sites are different, the program's different, but surely something about your philosophy stays constant. And uh, as it does for me. And I certainly haven't written as much as some of my colleagues, um, only very little actually, and, and have, as I am simply more comfortable building than, than, than writing. But the writing, in a sense, is my teaching. I wanted, and I still do, want to know what has happened how it's changed, not how it got new, but the role, the thing that makes architecture new, I suppose, the role of technology in architecture. And I find the gathering of that information never ending and very gripping and very exciting. And it isn't about looking at old things. I see students now being excited by the way they can make an object thing turn in space and inside out and right side up and upside down with the machine and that in itself becomes the moment of discovery. And that, is a, that could be a sculptor, it could be an architect, it could be a lot of things, but it isn't necessarily about the humanism and the myths and rituals of, an, of the origins of architecture. We are architects because we are humanists. And I am an architect because I'm a humanist. Um, my buildings today still reflect the idea of the window, the door, the passage, the threshold, the, the whole grammar and language of how we as a society made those things in our building over time. We're not talking about historical styles. We're talking about origins, beginnings, how something is understood by us as we approach it how we occupy it, how we enter it, leave it, all of those things become essential to an architecture and the architecture that I make. Um, when um, I started practicing architecture, um, I didn't know that, that uh, there was such a thing as a commercial practice like some of the big firms in New York. Uh, I soon, le uh, soon learned, but I thought the practices were like that of Le Corbusier uh, on one hand as an architect and uh, a painter, uh, a designer of furniture, objects, uh, a maker of books. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright, the same thing. Um, even people like Charles Eames, who made furniture as well as a, a few buildings uh, that he influenced as well as, of course, his house. Um, that's what I thought architects did, and when I began to understand history, I knew it's what architect, architects did when I looked at the lives of the Renaissance architects. And, painter, sculptor, architect. It was a continuous language for them and for me. 
I have tongue in cheek all my life said that I am a GP and granted a general practitioner. Uh, when Peter Eisenman came to Princeton in 63, um, he and I would look at catalogs. Um, Peter, I would say, was at that time much more interested than in in the uh, the book as a as an object than I was. I certainly got the bug from him. Um, in understanding the the role of that literature and what it could mean to us in our teaching. Um, let me tell you a story um, that when Peter and I were teaching together at Princeton, Peter had the idea of a new magazine, as Peter is extraordinarily interested in, in journals especially those that go belly up. Um, but we went to the Princeton uh, Architectural, no, not the, the Princeton Press, not the Princeton Architectural Press, it hadn't been invented yet, but the Princeton Press and the then uh, editor of the Princeton Press saw us and we were talking about the kind of magazine we wanted to do. And I remember taking a couple of my Vendigans with us and are explaining to the editor the format, the graphics, the binding, the texture of the page, the magazine or book as an object, completely filled with the information that everybody expected and then some. After we went on and on and emoted about all of this for a while, the then editor, he's no longer editor, sat back in his chair and he said, Mr. Eisenman, Mr. Graves, here at Princeton, we tend to read our books rather than feel them. <laughs> but then there are things you go after. Uh, and when I knew the role of people like Diderot, Duran, so on. I knew, uh, and Le Terri, I knew that I wanted some of that literature as well. And then there were people in our lives at the time, in my life, uh, like Colin Rowe, who told us or showed us the importance of something like Le Terri. I would have students who would say, when they went home for summer vacation, what can I do this summer? I don't have a job with an architect. And we would, we had by that time convinced the Princeton Architectural Press to republish the we I believe they did it, and, and buy that, and then simply trace plans of all things. Just, uh, and we would, in a kind of modernist vein, say it was, after all, Le Corbusier who said, unless you trace the lines, you will not remember. And so he did, and we did, and, and, and that little phrase helps me today in, in landscapes and buildings and other things that I want to remember. I draw it, and I take a sketchbook like other architects do.